Welcome to the second lecture in the course Remote Sensing Image Analysis and Interpretation and today we will talk about what is image analysis and what is image interpretation and uh, what are the differences and how we can use it for remote sensing images. And I want to start with the motivation and for the motivation Let's have a look at a uh, Landsat image. And this Landsat image shows crop circles in Saudi Arabia. And these circles has a diameter or, uh, have a diameter of one kilometer. And they have the specific, very characteristic shape because uh, of, an, of the irrigation system. And the irrigation system is called center pivot irrigation. Uh, so here the equipment rotates around the pivot element and the crops are watered with sprinklers. And let's have a look when we take a part of the image, what can we do with this image? Um, so one analysis technique uh, would be to have a look at histograms. Histograms indicate how often a specific value appears in the image. So here uh, I illustrated the RGB channel. And when we have a look at the red channel or the red band, uh, you can see the histogram of all the values, the intensity values from zero to 252. And the histogram indicates how often this value appears. And I did this here for the red, the green and the blue band. And in the green band, for example, you can see two peaks and the first peak um, belongs to all these um, dark green parts. Uh, in the image and um, for example in the blue band you can see there's no specific light blue or very dark blue virus in the image but you have two uh, yeah, peaks in the middle of this um, yeah, histogram. And this is one analysis technique. Uh, here you uh, look at the intensity values. Another analysis technique is segmentation. When you do segmentation, you group together pixels which are homogeneous in terms of pixel values. Um, this is, uh, you do not only have a look at the pixel values because you want to have segments in an image. You also have a look which pixels are close to each other and have similar values in terms of the pixel values. And this segmentation is very useful because you could replace pixel-wise operation by segment-based operation. For example, when you want to assign a pixel to a specific land cover, um, you could instead do this for a whole segment. And uh, yeah, this will speed up the whole uh, procedure by a lot. We will talk about um, image segmentation um, much more in a future lecture. So in the last two slides, I showed you two analysis uh, techniques. And now I want to show you one image interpretation technique. And one image interpretation, uh, interpretation you can perform is semantic segmentation. And here I underlined this, uh, the word semantic because on the last slide I showed you also a segmentation. But uh, here we focus on the semantics. Uh, when you do semantic segmentation, you uh, assign each pixel uh, to some kind of semantic. And uh, the result here are segments and each segment is homogeneous in terms of its semantic meaning. For example, in this image, here you have these crop circles and one semantic meaning could be it's a crop circle or agriculture area and the other one is desert. Um, so, um, when, you, when you think about what is the difference about analysis and interpretation, uh, you will see that when we looked at uh, analysis techniques, we extracted meaningful information from images using image processing methods. So, you use some tools from um, yeah, image processing such as histogram analysis or uh, um, finding segments and in contrast to this, when you do image interpretation, you identify objects and uh, try to understand the image content. So it's not only that you analyze what is actually in the image uh, regarding the pixel values or some intensities, it's more 
uh, you combine this with some uh, domain knowledge, uh, some semantics, something you want to uh, know specifically about the content in the image. And this is um, yeah, the difference. So every time you do some uh, classification, for example, you do image interpretation. But when you want to do um, some processing, such as um, how often is this green value in this image, you do image analysis. And for the, um, for the rest of the course today, I want to focus more on image interpretation. And um, when you think about what uh, can you all do with an image in terms of interpretation, what can be interpreted, there are different um, possibilities. So one um, possi possibility what you can do with an image is semantic segmentation. I already showed you um, one example in the motivation. Here's a more complex example. When you do semantic segmentation, you assign each pixel to one predefined class. And the pixels of the same class are grouped together to one se uh, semantic segment. So as before, you have segments and each segment uh, has a semantic meaning and each pixel in the segment had the same, has the same semantic meaning. Another interpretation um, task can be object detection. So here you do not want to uh, search for segments. You want to detect specific objects. Um, and these can be, for example, cars or trees or something else you're interested in in the scene. And mostly you use bounding boxes for it uh, to indicate where the object is. And these bounding boxes are also mostly parallel to image borders. That's uh, okay if you have, um, yeah, if uh, your object has uh, nearly the same extent, uh, extent uh, to all, yeah, to, uh, in all directions. But um, imagine you have, for example, a long ship and then you have a bonding box and the, um, the, uh, the box is parallel to the image borders. Uh, this can be a problem because uh, most of the box is not filled with the ship. Another um, yeah, interpretation task, which uh, uh, is quite hyped recently because it's uh, so interesting, um, is in instant segmentation. So instant segmentation is the combination of object detection and semantic segmentation. Um, here, it's not only that you detect single uh, object, like um, grapevine berries in this image, you also have a tight object boundary. So it's not only that you have a bounding box, but also you have the semantic segment. But uh, here, for example, the berries are um, neighbored in the image. So actually, if you would only do semantic segmentation, you would have a, um, a huge semantic segment with a lot of single grapevine berries in it. Here, you um, can indicate also single berries. Another um, interpretation task is image categorization. Here, you have a look at um, patches, image patches or parts of an image and you only want to know what is in this image. And uh, you don't care about uh, the exact pixel assignment to a specific class. Here you only want to know what's in this image. Sometimes it's, uh, it's enough when you, um, yeah, for example, use Google image search and you uh, want to search for uh, river, images with river, uh, it's enough that you yeah, get search results for images with ri rivers in it and you don't care about the exact position of the river in the image. And this is one um, example for image categorization. So here you can see different um, image patches and typical land, uh, land cover and land use classes such as tennis court or tanks or runway, something like this. And it's not only that you can assign one class to this image patch, you can also assign several ones. And if you are, um, yeah, want to determine even more information, you can also uh, try to extract the amount 
of this class in the image. And um, as you may realize, I already talked about land use and land cover. And land use and land cover is one huge topic the remote sensing community is interested in because it uh, helps a lot in remote sensing um, uh, research and climate science or uh, environmental science when you know uh, how the Earth's surface is covered with specific land use and land cover classes. And there's a, there's a, a huge difference between these both. So when we talk about land use, uh, land use is defined by activities and anthropogenic influence. So you talk about the type of use. And when we talk about land cover, it's just a biophysical coverage of the Earth's surface. Um, so here you can see an example for images which show specific land uses and land cover. So when you think of Greenland or grassland, um, a typical example for this land cover is indicated by the image with the red border. But if we talk about the land use, that means how, what is the type of use on, this, um, on the surface. Um, we talk about, uh, for example, a golf course or an area where uh, sheep are and they are fed with the, with the grass, something like this. So it's always, uh, you need to think about if the land covers enough or is, if you also want to know what's the type of use on the Earth's surface. So now there are different possibilities how you can estimate land use and land cover, always depending uh, what application tasks you want to solve and what you want to do with the information afterwards. So you can estimate land use and land cover classes. That means you have a discrete representation of the scene. A discrete representation would be you have a scene and then you decide on each pixel if it belongs to water or to forest or to an urban area. And for this we need classification methods. The other possibility is you estimate biophysical parameters. That means here you have a continuous representation of the scene. And for this you need uh, regression methods. And there's a fluent transition between both tasks. Uh, for example, uh, when you have a look at the Climate Change Initiative land cover product, um, you can see there's uh, uh, very specific classes uh, uh, in which each scene is classified. Uh, one class is, for example, you have a tree cover with more than 40% or there's tree cover about 15 to 40%. So you see it's nearly a continuous representation of the land use and the land cover, um, but still it's classification, but you have a lot of classes and yeah, very fine-grained class definitions. And here I want to show you how this uh, climate change initiative land cover product looks like. Uh, this is um, provided by European Space Agency and you can have a look uh, in the web and use it and uh, play around with it. And on the left side, you can see all these fine grained classes. And on the right side, this is the actual classification uh, of, the, of Europe. And the colors are yeah, uh, indicating which class each pixel is assigned to. So far, we had a look at land use and land cover, but only for a specific point in time. But when you think back, uh, what I told you in the last lecture, we were talking about monitoring. And monitoring is not only about a uh, current state um, of the Earth's surface, you also want to know um, what happened over time. So you want to know how the Earth changes over time. And interpreted satellite images, when you do this for several time steps, this can help us to analyze the, uh, the change. And here we can, um, can have, uh, we can have a look at two different types of changes. So one type is we talk about land cover conversion. Land cover conversion is when an entire land cover class is re replaced by another class. So when you have a look at the pixel and in this pixel was forest, 
and the next time step there's water then you have a land cover conversion the other uh, type of change is land cover modification and here you have a gradual change of the nature of a land cover of a land cover class um, Examples for this are the intensification of the agriculture or desertification or selective logging. So this is uh, not only that you say um, time step one, class one, time step two, class two. So there's a complete change of the class. It's more like a gradual change and um, uh, so that the characteristics of the land cover class changes over time. And here's one example of uh, land cover conversion. This always happens when you have a natural disaster and you have an image before the disaster and an image after this disaster. So here uh, illustrated are two satellite images um, in pseudo-color representation of the Mississippi flood in 2011. So this disaster uh, happened because of the late winter and the early spring in 2011, uh, which were filled with snowmelt and heavy rain events. And there was also the largest outbreak of tornadoes ever recorded. And this caused this, um, this disaster uh, because uh, all these events lead to, that the, to the event that the Mississippi began to swell in April. And this was actually captured with satellite images. And here, when you look at specific areas in the image, you can see there's a conversion from uh, urban area to uh, river or water. An example for land cover modification is, as I said, selective, lo uh, selective logging. Selective, uh, selective logging is um, when you do de uh, deforestation resulting in a, a regular pattern. So uh, this is an image of this uh, showing this typical pattern. So do we have one row of trees that uh, has been cut down and the neighboring uh, row, uh, no trees were cut down. So you have a row with deforestation and a row with forest. And this is a kind of deforestation without radical intervention, intervention in uh, the ecosystem, but still it's deforestation. So let's have a closer look at how you can uh, differentiate uh, between land cover conversion and land cover modification and where you can make the cut when it's conversion and when it's modification. Generally, we can say that the smaller the number of classes or the course of the class definition, the lower the amount of land cover conversion. So when we go back to the last example and we have a specific, um, yeah, you, we have a look at a specific part of the image, we could say uh, we want to have a look when forest turns into deforestation. So you have two classes and uh, for specific parts in the image um, where, um, yeah, where is a lot of deforestation, you could say okay, there was a change from forest to deforestation. But if you, for example, integrate a third class, the selectively locked forest, it's actually for this task much easier. And you could say there is a conversion from dense forest to selectively locked forest to deforestation. So it's much easier um, yeah, to classify specific parts uh, of the image into three of these specific classes. If you only use two classes, it would be um, yeah, hard to distinguish when, there's for, uh, when um, the area is actually deforested or not. Another example can be seen here. So this is a forecast of Africa could look like in the year 3015 if the current uh, development of the climate continues. Um, this change um, of Africa and how it looks like is particularly obvious when you look at uh, the uh, Madadas Madagascar island or uh, the Strait of Gibraltar. And if you only look at these two images, you have a lot of land cover conversion. So there are a lot of um, areas in the image where there's a conversion from land to ocean. 
Um, but if you look at the small scale specific pixels or smaller areas in the image, and also with many images over time, you can also see modification within one land cover class. Um, one example I already mentioned is desertification. That means there's a slow transformation of forest or grassland into desert. And to understand land cover modification a bit better, I want to show you what mixed pixels are. Because uh, for us, um, there can uh, either be a tree or a desert, but what actually a satellite image uh, looks like and how the sensors see the world is a bit different. So what are mixed pixels? Um, on the left side, you can see the reality. So let's have a look at an example where you have, for example, um, yeah, a, uh, a brown building on green grass. And if you now take an image, an area image or a satellite image of the scene, you will get such an image raster illustrated on, on the right side. Um, and depending on the spatial resolution, the image raster is more or less coarse. And you, the problem is now, uh, you can only get one intensity per pixel. So depending on the spatial resolution, you get a very coarse image where you cannot uh, see a lot of details, or you get uh, yeah, a more fine-grained image with a higher spatial resolution, you, so you can see much more uh, details in it. And in each pixel, uh, you get a mixture of this brown and green. And for our Africa example, so deserts form slowly. That means over time, the amount of sand getting bigger and bigger in single pixels. So it's, uh, you get, if you have a look at one pixel, you get more and more amount of sand in this pixel. And we are not only talking about colors and RGB, we are talking about spectral characteristics. So um, a mixed pixel is nothing else than the mixture of all these spectral characteristics. Um, you can, for example, mix hyperspectral signatures and then you get a mixed pixel with a mixed hyperspectral signature. And um, this can actually be used to describe the land cover modification. So when the uh, spectral characteristic of a specific pixel changes, uh, then you can relate this to the land cover modification because the modification is defined as the gradual change of the characteristic of a land cover class. Another thing you must be aware of is that when you increase the distance to the object, it will decrease the spatial resolution and this will increase the amount of mixed pixels. So think about area photos. They have a lot of detail, um, but the field of view is very small. When you take the sensor and bring it on board uh, a satellite and you uh, take a satellite image, the number of pixels is still the same, but the satellite covers a much larger area. And this will lead uh, to um, uh, increase of mixed pixels because the spatial resolution will decrease and this will increase the amount of mixed pixels. The objects get smaller and smaller and smaller in the image and so the pixel size is still the same, so you get a lot of mixture of different land cover classes in it. So now you know uh, what kind of changes can happen with land cover, but in order to be able to make a reliable statement about the change, you have to consider some things when analyzing and interpreting the data. The first thing you, uh, is you need to ensure the relative and absolute geometric comparability of the data. So any remote sensing image, regardless of whether it is acquired by the MISO spectral sensor um, on board a satellite or a camera in a plane or any other platform sensor combination, you will have various geometric distortion. This can be caused, for example, by the perspective of the sensor optics, the motion of the sensor while acquiring the image, uh, the terrain, the curvature of the Earth, but also there's um, sensor distortion. So data sets must be precisely located with respect to each other. If you don't do it, uh, 
in the first row, there's an example uh, what can happen. So here you have again the brown building, but the brown building is at a different uh, location because the, yeah, the uh, data sets uh, were not located precisely to each other. And uh, the results when you do change detection is shown uh, on the left side. So white indicates there's change and black there's no change. So this is actually called pseudo change because this is not a change which is actually there in reality. Um, another thing is the sensor distortions. They must be corrected beforehand. This can be um, done in, in the lab, for example. Um, and here you can see uh, two images, uh, one where the sensor is not distorted uh, and the other one what happens when you do not correct for the sensor distortion. And this can also lead to um, pseudo change in an image. The second thing you need to ensure is the relative and absolute spectral comparability of the data. For all procedures that work uh, immediately directly on the spectral values of the data, a sensor calibration, um, a atmospheric correction and possibly a topographic correction is necessary. Regarding the sensor calibration, uh, here we refer to the sensitivity of the sensor or the exposure time uh, and th all this can vary. Uh, but when you want to compare the images, this must be all the same. The atmospheric correction is the process of removing the effects of the atmosphere on a reflectance value uh, of an image taken by a satellite or airborne sensor. And sometimes also the topography has an influence. So in addition to the position of the sun at the time uh, when the image uh, was taken, the topography in the immediate vicinity determines whether a piece of forest, for example, is sunny or shaded. And this can therefore show different uh, intensities in the image, uh, although they, they uh, are the same in reality. So here what you can uh, see is a so-called image mosaic. So these are four images taken by a satellite sensor. And uh, because they were taken at different points uh, in time, they show different spectral values because of various um, yeah, uh, influences such as the atmosphere. And here you need to correct for this, otherwise you would have uh, nearly everywhere a, um, a change, which is actually a pseudo change. The third thing is you need to ensure the comparability of geometric and spectral resolution. Um, we already talked about uh, different resolutions of uh, sensors, um, and we talked about the rep uh, repetition rate of satellites, uh, which can vary. And sometimes you want to compare at two specific points in time. But if you if you are lucky, you have images for the specific points in time. But mostly you are not so lucky. Um, so uh, you need to use different sensor system. And due to the limited data availability, um, so it's often not possible that you have the images of the same sensor. So you need a comparison of multi sensor data and this is mostly unavoidable. And it's especially difficult when you have uh, different imaging systems. So imagine you have a multi spectral image and a SAR image, but actually you, you want to infer the change uh, of a scene. And uh, here you need to to think about a little bit longer because it's actually uh, something different which is shown in the image. But here, um, yeah, you need to um, uh, have um, additional um, knowledge and addi uh, additional information about uh, how the sensor system work and what they actually show in the image and if there's change in it. The last thing you need to ensure is that you have comparable phenological stages. Um, so think of the phenolo uh, phenology of agricultural crops which might change uh, between the years. So it can happen that in one year you, um, uh, you have plants and they are harvested in 
let's say August, uh, but in the next year you have the same plant, um, similar development, but the harvest is planned for September. So it's not that it's not enough that you um, compare the same time steps bet uh, between the years. You need to have a look at the phenological stages when you want to compare the development of uh, plants or crops um, between the years. And this is also the case um, when you have uh, uncovered soil, for example, dry soil looks different than uh, wet soil. Um, and again, if you do not take care of this, um, errors may lead to pseudo change in the change analysis. So generally, um, there are different um, possibilities how you can now uh, actually detect the change and how you can yeah, provide your change detection results to others. Um, for example, there's a binary detection of the change. So you're not uh, interested in what has actually changed, but only if there's change or not. And a possible procedure is that you subtract the images and you set a threshold. So it's just uh, um, when you did all the things I told you before, you just subtract the images from each other and then you set a threshold. And if there are values above the threshold, there's change. The problem is now how to set the threshold. So what change is relevant and is this actual change or pseudo change? If your threshold is too low, there might be the risk that you have a lot of pseudo change. Um, another possibility is that you have an exact description of the change. So not only that there was change, you also want to know, uh, want to know what has changed. And an example is uh, that forest changes to settlement or forest change to agriculture. So here you need a clear definition of the classes and um, one possibility would be to have um, a classification of the scene and then you do not compare the scenes but also uh, you, you have a look um, at which pixel the land cover class has changed and from what class to, uh, to which class. Um, another possibility is a detailed quantification of the modification. For example, the amount uh, of forest cover loss. So going back to the selective logging, uh, you could, for example, count the trees or analyze the uh, amount of greenness in the scene. And then you can um, yeah, quantify how much um, the scene has changed uh, in yeah, regarding forest. So here's one example uh, where you can analyze the land cover conversion. And as I said, land cover conversion can be detected when you, uh, when you directly compare land cover maps. And this is a quite a nice but shocking example. I really like to show it be uh, because this um, a time series of images shows one of the world's largest man-made environmental disasters. And uh, first of all, you can see much more with the satellite image. It, uh, with these images, you can realize how much has changed, but also we can quantify how much the uh, this scene has changed. So what you can see here is the Arasi in um, located in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And you can see it uh, lost water a lot over time. And um, what you can do is to quantify the change, you derive land cover um, classification, land cover masks, and then you directly compare these masks with each other. So here you can, at each pixel location, you can, for example, look at if there's a change in the land cover class or not. So in the second part of the lecture, I want to focus on classification. I already used the term classification um, within the last lecture and also today in this lecture, because this is a procedure how we can derive a land use and land cover map. And this is actually what is uh, of, um, of high interest in the remote sensing community. 
And land use and land cover classification is generally defined as a semantic segmentation of an entire scene. So remember, semantic segmentation is when you assign each pixel in the scene, in the scene to a specific um, predefined class. And in this case, this is an example from uh, Rodonia in Brazil. And here we are interested in forest and deforestation. So we want to know for each pixel if uh, it shows forest or if it shows deforestation. And in the end, you can get such a land use and land cover map uh, where yeah, you have black and white indicating uh, where forest and where deforestation is. And let's have a more detailed look how we can actually derive such a land use and land cover map. And for this, we need a classification framework. And um, it's not enough that we have uh, just uh, sensor data. We need more. We need, uh, we need additional information. And this additional is, uh, information is, prov uh, is provided by experts, somebody else, or uh, maybe also by yourself. And this additional information is that somebody tells you for a specific uh, pixel position in the image, what the land cover class is there. Um, and these are called labeled pixels. So for labeled pixels, you know exactly, ah, okay, there's forest and there's deforestation. Everywhere where you do not have such information, we are talking about unlabeled uh, data or unlabeled pixels when we do, um, yeah, when we deal with images. And this is, um, yeah, we need this information uh, when we want to perform supervised classification. Supervised classification is, um, uh, as the name says, classification with supervision. And the supervision is done that uh, some information, some additional information is given um, for the process, in this case uh, by providing for some pixels the land use and land cover class. And um, the next step is you need to think about um, what might be uh, useful to distinguish between forest and deforestation. And uh, in the easiest case, you take the intensities. And when you think of, um, or when you have a look at the image, uh, you see that forest is mostly green and deforestation is not so green anymore. So you can actually use the intensities to um, yeah, to, uh, uh, to classify for each pixel if it's forest or not. But it's not that you want to do it, you want to have an automatic process for it. And when you want to have an automatic process, you need to learn a model, a model which can be applied to all pixels and gives you a decision about if it's forest or deforestation. And this model is learned and uh, uh, the, the step in which the model is learned is called learning or training step. So um, in this uh, step, what you actually do is you learn a decision boundary. The decision boundary is um, yeah, a boundary which, uh, on, uh, uh, which can be used to make a decision about forest and deforestation. And the testing step is here you take all the um, the uh, unlabeled pixels and you assign to them um, yeah, a class. And if you do this for all pixels, you get uh, such a land use and a land cover class. And in the end, you also want to know how good your model is. This is the evalu uh, evaluation, but also you can do some post-processing steps. And um, yeah, within, uh, within the, this lecture and the next lectures, I want uh, to guide you through all the single steps and tell a little bit more about it. But first of all, let's um, talk a bit more about the terms I will use. And imagine the following. You have, uh, you have a, uh, a satellite image or some area image, and now you want to learn a supervised classification model. First thing, you need this additional information. You need labels. And imagine uh, someone was in, uh, in this case, in Rheinauer in Bonn and uh, ga uh, gave you information about 
everywhere where I marked this green in the image, there is vegetation. Uh, everywhere where I marked uh, this area is uh, blue in the image, there is water. And uh, the person does it for the four classes, urban, background, vegetation and water. We already talked about that uh, it uh, might be enough to distinguish between um, specific classes by just taking their intensity values. And these intensity values can be, for example, red and near infrared. And um, if you take all these labels and put this into the coordinate system and uh, by using the red and near infrared value, you can already see there are some clusters and these clusters can be um, in the best case assigned to land cover classes. Um, but let's talk a bit more about the terms. So uh, we have classes, in this case urban, background, vegetation and water. Uh, we have data samples. Um, data samples are actually pixels, but uh, when they're used in the feature space. And the feature space is this coordinate system I was talking about and the uh, coordinate axes are the feature dimensions. And in our case, we use two feature dimensions, red and near infrared, but you can use hundreds of them. So every, everything you can turn into features and represent as numbers you can use as uh, features. And then, um, yeah, we have uh, some additional pixels um, where uh, we might not know uh, what, um, yeah, which land cover class they belong to. And uh, I already mentioned these are uh, test samples. So um, we want to, uh, we want to uh, assign a class based on our learned model. And now uh, we need to be a little bit careful. Um, Generally, we, uh, I told you we have labeled data. This labeled data is uh, also called reference data or sometimes also ground truth. Um, a part of the reference data, a part of the labels, uh, labeled data is um, used as training data. So this training data is used to train the model, to learn the model and to determine the decision boundary between the classes. But Another part is treated as, as, um, as test data. So we, uh, we treat it as non-existent and we treat it as there, is, uh, there would be no label. Why, uh, why are we doing this? Because uh, we want to independently evaluate our classifier. We want to know how good our classifier is. And um, for this we need labels because we need to check if it's actually uh, right or wrong what we estimated. And so uh, when we talk about training data and test data, the test data can be, uh, can be seen as data which, uh, where we have no labels, where we actually have no idea what, uh, which land cover class they belong to. But we can also Actually, there can be labels and we use this as uh, for classifier evaluation. So let's get um, a little bit more into detail about a classification task. And um, so first of all, consider we have given some feature vectors. These feature vectors, as I already said, are defined by um, yeah, some, it's, it's nothing else than a collection of uh, specific features. We denote them by phi, so phi1 uh, to phi n. So we have n feature vectors and it's just a collection of um, yeah, different features and each row is a feature dimension. This can be, for example, red, green, blue, or you can have temperature values, coordinates, or some, um, some additional information about plants, something like this. And uh, now, the, class, uh, the classification the ta uh, task is defined as to learn a function f that assigns a class given an observation phi. And this function f is actually our classifier. And uh, this classifier uh, gets as input an observation and is parameterized by uh, parameters w. 
I will show you in the next slide what this W actually means. And um, depending on which kind of classifier, they are, and there are a lot, um, so depending on which classifier you uh, take, these uh, parameters are um, yeah, differently defined or mean something else and parameterized, uh, are parameterized in a different way. But in the end, what you want to have is this function. You get an input, the feature, and you get an output class. And um, yeah, it's not so easy. Uh, we need to go a little bit more into detail. And for this, let's have a look at a simple linear classification. So for simple linear classification, you have um, inputs um, and you have outputs, as for all classifiers. The inputs are your observations. In this case, we have two-dimensional uh, feature. Um, and uh, that means 2D uh, data samples. And uh, the output is your response. So here you, we must be a bit careful um, because uh, the output are not our class labels. The output um, is more a value which can be used to derive the class label. For example, it's a distance to the decision boundary and the sign will tell you on which side of the decision boundary the sample is. So you know, depending on which side it is, uh, you can assign it to a specific class. So uh, this linear classifier is, uh, here's uh, the, uh, the equation for it, is defined by a bias term, which is uh, the intercept with the y-axis and um, the other parameters uh, which you need to learn uh, are the weights. So this is the direction of the decision boundary. So it's defined by the direction and uh, with the intercept with the y-axis. Okay, um, so how exactly now can we obtain a classifier? Um, and here I want to refer to a definition by Mitchell from 1997. And this uh, definition says, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience E. And the statement seems quite uh, complicated, but it's not. So, uh, I want to, do, uh, to help uh, you a bit um, with understanding what is meant with the statement. Um, I want to go through specific parts of the statement. When we talk about experience E, we talk exactly about these input-output pairs. And these input-output pairs, as I said before, are actually the labeled, uh, the labeled samples, so also called training data, labeled data, reference data, and so on. So these pairs is, you always have a feature vector and you have a class label. And this is the experience, because you have the experience uh, that you can label this specific feature vector or the specific pixel. Um, then um, there's some class of task T. Uh, a task is exactly this interpretation task. So you think about um, if you want to use semantic segmentation or uh, if you want to do object detection. And yeah, uh, depending on what you want to do, you need a different um, classifier or a different um, yeah, uh, you need to define the task, how you solve it in a specific way. And then there's a performance measure. The performance measure is, um, I mean, you need to know when your model is good, also to, to train the model and also to evaluate it. Um, so imagine you have an image and there's a tree in it and it's tree, so it's, it's good. But when you have a yeah, when you have a tree and it's classified it's cat, it's not good. And this is ex exactly what is done with a performance measure. So um, you have some value, some, some measure, some metric, uh, which gives you a value when something is good and when something is wrong. And then there's the word improves. 
What does it mean? Uh, I talked about uh, parameters which define uh, a classifier and the parameters are mostly iteratively optimized. Um, therefore, they improve with more experience. So the more labeled data uh, you provide to the classifier, the more it can learn. So the better it gets and it pr improves therefore with more experience. And um, this is a, yeah, a quite good definition what machine learning is. So actually how um, a computer program come, can learn. And I want to show you uh, two simple classifiers. So for now, I um, provide you with um, yeah, some, um, some explanation about these two classifiers. But in, um, in the next two lectures, I will talk a bit more into detail um, how you can actually learn a classifier and how, uh, which parts you need to accomplish to do this. So let's have a look at um, yeah, two classifiers, the nearest neighbor classifier and the decision tree. The nearest neighbor classifier is when the test data is assigned to a class based on proximity to training data. The uh, a decision tree is when test data is classified based on, uh, based on decision rules which were derived from the training data. So they're totally different, but in the end, uh, both of them um, yeah, have, uh, can assign test data based on a learned model. And remember that I said that classifiers are learned and trained and they are tested. So we have two steps. One is the, um, the training step where you use all the labeled data and then you use the testing step where you either just want to assign a class label or you want to evaluate a classifier. And when you look at the nearest neighbor classifier, um, you have given some training data as in this example, and you're done with the training step. This, uh, that's easy. You're just done. So you're ready for testing. You just use the training data as it is. And um, then if you get new samples, new data samples, the test data, um, you assign them based uh, on um, the class of the nearest uh, training data sample. So you just have a look uh, where's the nearest point uh, where I have a label and then you assign them to the same class label. So of course this is a nice example uh, I illustrated here but it's not always that it works quite good when you uh, do it like this. Um, because there, yeah, because there are some problems. So first of all, um, you need to be aware that the training data represents the distribution of the whole data. Actually, it's nearly never the case that you have uh, that you can have such an amount of training data that you can represent the whole world and the whole variation of uh, specific classes. And additional problems are uh, that you have noisy data. So it's, um, there can be uh, some, some errors in the data. And also it's problematic for features and classes with, uh, with different variances. So remember I talked about this coordinate system and the feature dimensions and that uh, not all features have the same characteristics and the same, um, yeah, the same range. Um, and, but mostly you use, uh, um, uh, Euclidean distance as a distance, um, yeah, as a distance metric to define what, uh, or to, yeah, to um, determine what is the closest training data sample to a given test data sample. Um, yeah, and this is a problem when you use it, um, and the feature di dimension have different variances. So illustrated here is one example. Uh, so one dimension has a, a high variance and the other feature dimension has a, a, a small variance. And um, it's better to scale all features to the same range so that all dimensions have the same importance. Because otherwise, if you use Euclidean distance, um, it, has, uh, it turns out that um, different feature dimensions have a different importance. To overcome the mentioned problems, um, you can extend the nearest neighbor classifier. 
So uh, imagine the following situation. You have two classes and um, either you have noisy data or you have such um, yeah, classes with a different characteristic. So in this case, uh, it might be um, not so easy to assign the test data sample um, to one of the two classes in red uh, uh, and in blue. And you can extend the nearest neighbor classifier uh, to k nearest neighbor or the use of an epsilon uh, neighborhood. So what you do is you do not only have a look at the nearest neighbor, but to um, let's say 10 of, uh, um, or 20 neighbors, and then you consider all the class labels of the neighbors. And in this case, um, it would be more reasonable to um, assign the test data sample to the red class because you have much more neighbors um, yeah, assigned to the red class than to the blue class. So another um, uh, a simple classifier I want to show you in this lecture is a decision tree. This decision tree is a uh, yeah, the, the basic principle is totally different from a uh, nearest neighbor classifier. And um, the decision rules can be learned or defined manually. So today I do not want to talk about how this, uh, um, yeah, this decision rules can be learned. I just want to show you the basic principle behind the decision tree and, um, you can, um, and how we can define such uh, decision rules manually. So when you have a look at uh, this example, um, you can see that there's a clear difference uh, in the red values when you look at all the, uh, all the classes. And you can make a decision, you can define a decision rule that you say, if the values um, are of a data sample are above a specific threshold, a specific value, then it's urban background, and if it's below, uh, it can be assigned to water and vegetation. So there is actually a decision rule which is able to, um, yeah, to split, make a split in, in the feature space so that uh, two classes can be um, lie on one side of the decision boundary and the other two classes on the other side of the decision boundary. But this is not uh, enough. So one decision rule is not enough. You need another one. And you can say, oh, okay, uh, I can make a, um, I can set a threshold in the near infrared. Um, and so that I can say if the, um, if the uh, data sample has a near infrared value behind the threshold, it's water and it's, uh, if, uh, the value is higher, it's vegetation. And this can be um, done also with uh, another, um, another threshold. And here you can distinguish between urban and background. So the result is now you have three decision rules. And with these three decision rules, um, you can distinguish between these uh, four classes. And as I said, so now we defined it manually by uh, looking at the data, but this can also be learned. And now when you have test data samples, they can be assigned based on the decision rules. So you just look on which side of all the decision boundary um, it's positioned and then you can decide on, uh, yeah, decide on, uh, on, the, um, on the class label. I already told you that uh, there are a lot of different classifiers and in the last part of the lecture I want to give you an impression how we can uh, categorize classifiers. So one categorization is when we distinguish between generative and discriminative classifiers. Generative classifiers is when we uh, model the data, so we have a specific look at uh, the data and we learn how uh, data samples of a specific class are distributed. So that um, um, when doing this, we learn a distribution of the data. And based on the learned distribution of the data, we derive a decision boundary from it. So, uh, and also because we model the distribution of the data, we can generate new data from it. And that's why it's called generative classifiers. 
So when we know how our data is distributed, we just decide um, where is a good position of the decision boundary that um, yeah, uh, the distributions are um, separated in a good way. Um, when we talk about discriminative classifiers, it's uh, maybe you already realize it from the name. We do not model the data. We do not care about the distribution of the data. We directly determine the decision boundary. So we are actually only interested how to discriminate between all the classes we want to distinguish. And during the next lectures, I want to uh, focus on generative classifiers, especially the uh, Bayes classifier, because uh, this is one of the most basic classifiers. Uh, it's, um, it's based on the Bayes theorem. And when you understand how you can use the Bayes theorem, you have a very good basis for um, to understand all the other classifiers and how you can learn feature distributions and how you can characterize data and so on. It's, it's, good, it's good to know uh, how Bayes theorem works and how you can classify with them. Um, okay, to conclude, uh, what have you learned today? In this lecture, you learned about what is image analysis and what is image interpretation, uh, how we can detect change and how can uh, uh, classification help us to detect change. Then we talked in detail about uh, supervised classification, what the supervised means and how the classification pipeline is defined. And then I showed you uh, already two simple classifiers, the nearest neighbor classifier and decision trees. And in the next lectures, we talk a bit more about uh, features, what, uh, which features can be extracted from rem remote sensing images. Um, we talk about a Bayes classifier and we talk about uh, how we can learn distributions and characterize our, um, our data. And yeah, all how all this comes together to, for uh, remote sensing image analysis and interpretation. Thanks a lot for listening and I hope we see each other in uh, my next lecture. So thank you very much for your attention and goodbye.